Welcome to Trench Diaries. Iron Coffins, Part 8. Alarm! We jumped into the hatch and U-557 left the surface in a rapid descent. The chief balanced the boat, then brought her up to periscope death, but Paulson's view of the ships was blocked by the menacing icebergs. He frantically rotated the scope in his search for the enemy and his attempt to avoid hitting the submerged portion of the mountains. Then he finally caught sight of the three ships. He identified them as British cruisers of the London class. Focusing the scope on the targets, he ordered all tubes made ready for firing. He corrected his findings and changed course several times, then waited for the one second when all values would be in perfect coordination. But that second never came. The targets changed course abruptly and steamed away at 24 knots, far in excess of our own top speed. Paulson shook his head in dismay. After a short waiting period, we surfaced and set a new course to meet with our tanker. The icebergs gradually diminished as we sailed closer to Greenland's southwest coast. Early on the third day after our encounter with the British cruisers, we found the lonely Bällchen at the designated place. Approaching slowly, we announced ourselves, exchanged courtesies through the megaphone and called the line to which the oil hose was fastened. Paulson maneuvered U-557 into the near-invisible wake of the tanker. She was a low, long ship of approximately 15,000 tons and probably carried enough fuel to supply our boats for months or even a year. One of our machinists attached the hose to an outboard valve and secured the rope on deck. Then U-557 began to suck the much needed oil into her empty tanks. Foodstuffs were shuttled from Belgian by rubber boats. At noon we received company. Another U-boat had found her way to the supply ship and made her fueling connection with the tanker. At 1500 the assembly grew to three U-boats. U-93 with court in command arrived and stood by at some distance in the icy waters. It was a rare and strange congregation, four German vessels in a lost corner of the North Atlantic. Pleasantries circulated from boat to boat and also our warning of the three British cruisers. At 1700 we removed the hose, transferred it aboard U-93, wished each other good hunting and separated from the group. U-557 took on a southwesterly course, running at high speed toward an evening sky. Four hours later, during a dive to trim the boat, we heard three hollow detonations far astern. A whole series of booms followed. The bombardment lasted 10 minutes. It came from the exact position of the Bällchen. We were certain that the British cruisers had finally located their target. At 2300, U-557 surfaced and made radio contact with high command. We reported our refueling and the probable fate of Bällchen. Sometime between midnight and dawn, our radio operator intercepted a confirming message. It said, Belgian with captain sunk by British surface warships. Rescued crew, fueling not completed. Return to base with 93 men. U-93. We proceeded toward Grid Square BB90 to operate on the Conway route between Halifax and St. John's. Passing through the area where the icy Labrador current meets the warm Gulf Stream, we were enveloped in heavy fog, but the curtain rose the moment we crossed the 47th parallel. The radiant sunshine surprised us after several days of blindness. The sea was choppy, but the air was mild. We slowly patrolled the routes for two days with only one diesel working at a time. It was mid-June and the summer season was about to reach its peak. On each watch, my thoughts wandered back across the Atlantic, some 3,500 miles east, to where Marianne was awaiting some sign of my safe return. I recalled for the hundredth time our last tete -a tete and dreamed about a Wiedersehen on the beaches of the Wannsee in Berlin. Love and life seemed so long ago, so far away, almost unreal. At 1600, on one of those flawlessly sunny days, I was released from my watch after sitting on the rim of the bridge for hours, skimming the horizon. I went below and had a sandwich garnished with rancid butter and green mold. I sweetened it with a heavy portion of strawberry jam and washed it down with strong coffee. But at 18.15 the meal ended abruptly. A cry arose from the bridge, electrifying, blood curling. Both full ahead, right full rudder, torpedoes on starboard. I leaped through the control room and up the tower. Reaching the bridge as the diesels began to howl, I spotted three sparkling streaks rushing toward us with insane accuracy. The horrifying sight of death coming closer paralyzed us and during those very last seconds I braced myself to meet eternity. In a moment the foamy streaks would hit the boat. Now. 
Now. But there was no detonation. Not even the sound of steel hitting steel. Astonishment at our survival overcame us. As we spun around to port side, the ghostly wakes of the torpedoes revealed to us that two of them had underpassed U-557 amidships and one had shot by the rudder astern. Still not quite certain that we were still alive, we inhaled deeply and our hearts began to beat again. U-557, in agonizing sluggishness, had finally turned to starboard and achieved greater speed. Ahead of us was the launching point of the enemy's torpedoes, a swell clearly visible on the choppy surface. Within moments we reached the spot. Paulson, who mounted the bridge only seconds after death had brushed us, shouted out determined orders. Battle stations, clear the bridge! The crew eagerly prepared for a duel between U-boat and submarine. The alarm shrieked and U-557 plunged after her attacker into the black depths. The captain ordered all tubes flooded and made himself comfortable in the control room, where he could concentrate on both the sounding gear and the torpedo computer. This was a different kind of fighting. Our boat sailed in almost complete soundlessness, but our listening gear located the enemy sub in a westerly direction. But as soon as we had her dead ahead, her propeller swishing gradually diminished. The enemy was on the run. We chased her with all our power but to no avail. The enemy submarine was faster. Paulson became suspicious. I bet that sub is going to surface. Chief, prepare for surfacing. Have diesels ready for immediate high speed. I followed the captain into the tower. The sound man's voice came through the tube. Enemy blowing all tanks. Paulson countered. Surface, blow out the tanks with both diesels full ahead. Moments later, the boat cleared the water and we stormed through the bridge with our glasses trained dead ahead. There she was, no more than 8,000 meters before our tubes. With three times full ahead, we chased the sub. Her fuming diesels made it obvious that she too was under full power to evade our counterattack. She began to zigzag. Her erratic dashes gave us views of her superstructure to compare with diagrams in the International Naval Catalog. Paulsen and Cairn soon discovered that she was indeed a British submarine of the Thames class. We realized that the British submarine was our superior in size and speed. Since it was fruitless to chase her, we changed course and followed the attacker with our glasses until she disappeared behind the horizon in the direction of Boston. We wondered what the British skipper would say for failing to sink us with three torpedoes. He had made a perfect approach and fired an excellent torpedo spread. Two torpedoes out of three would have been hits, if the torpedoes had been set to run at a proper death. Whatever caused the failure, it had saved the lives of 51 men. At sunset and 25 miles later, the captain ordered U-557 below surface to celebrate the survival of the entire crew. We called it a birthday party. The same night, after resurfacing, we informed High Command have been attacked by British submarine in CC-36. Counter-attack. Enemy escaped. U-557. I think this is a good time to stop the story for now and do some history. Because as you know from the last engagements, I no longer trust the English version of the book when it comes to these things. Uh, but the good news is this incident um, really took place again. Um, I cross-checked with the German book as well as with U-557's war diary. And this incident indeed happened on June 15th, 1941 and gets covered extensively. I will put the page on screen as well as the approximate position of where it happened. Speaking to Parsons' character, he doesn't just write it down without comment, he actually tries to solve the problem of how it had come to this. And uh, in the end he totally blames himself for patrolling for days on the exact same course uh, back and forth. The enemy submarine was probably not of the Thames class, or river class as it's also known, because uh, the Thames class comprised only three boats, HMS Thames the namesake, HMS Severn and HMS Clyde, but uh, neither of which were active in that area in June 1941. Um, Thames was sunk in September of 1940 while hunting for Gneisenau and both Severn and Clyde were operating in the Mediterranean during the time when U-557 was attacked. Another interesting part of the war diary is U-557's encounter with the tanker Bällchen. Now, Bällchen itself is quite an interesting ship. Um, she was built in 1932 as Süßla by the uh, Göteborgen in uh, Göteborg, Sweden. Um, or Sweden for that matter, sorry. Um, and she was then seized in 1940 after the German occupation of Sweden and renamed Bällchen. Uh, she was then used as a so-called Stützpunkt tanker or base tanker 
um, that's the literal translation. Um, tankers of this kind were used to resupply ships on far away naval bases, hence the name. And there were a total of 41 of these ships. And interestingly, Belchen was the only one out of all of them to be used as a floating resupply ship in open waters. While doing this, she was actually stopped and inspected multiple times by the British and Americans, but uh, she disguised herself as the Swedish tanker Stockholm every time. And this worked until it didn't and she was sunk while resupplying U-93 by HMS Kenya and HMS Aurora, both British cruisers. I guess it's pretty hard to be a pretend Swede when there's a German U-boat guzzling fuel from your tanks southwest of Greenland. Anyway, Belgian sank with the loss of five of her crew and the 47 survivors were rescued by U-93 and brought back to Saint-Nazaire. Um, I want you to think about this for a minute. Um, Belgian was sunk on June 3rd, 1941. Uh, U-93 returned to Saint-Nazaire on June the 10th, which is a full week later. And you know how cramped a Type 7 boat already is during normal operations and yet they sailed for over 3,000 miles and seven days with double the usual complement. That must have been quite impressive for everyone involved and uh, I wanted to look this up in U-93's war diary but unfortunately the scan quality is really really bad and most of it is unreadable. Um, but you can make out that the captain listed every survivor by name and rank and spoke at length about what had happened. Now, concerning our own boat, uh, in the war diary U557's captain also speaks a bit about the Belgian. Uh, he commended her crew for working in a swift and professional way and also noted that he was asked by Belgian's captain to relay that Belgian's own radio was broken and they could only receive but no longer transmit. So all in, this was another interesting episode and um, as you may or may not know, there were actually a couple of times during World War II when submarines engaged other submarines, but only one time when a submerged boat sank another submerged boat. This of course being HMS Ventura sinking U-864 off the west coast of Norway in August 1942. Um, quite impressive considering the rather primitive sensors and fire control at the time. But anyway, this is it for this episode. See you next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoy this channel, you know how the algorithm works. Like, comment, subscribe. It means a lot to me. See you in the next video.